Hi, I'm Parker Dahl. And I'm Warren Eikhoff. And welcome to So What? A place where we ask the question that so many of our students are thinking about when it comes to historical events. So what? Why do I need to know about another war? There are so many wars in the 20th century. Can't we talk about something just a little happier? The following are but some of the answers to those questions, and as always, you should make up your opinion based on the facts. Today, we will talk to you about the Cold War. Specifically, the consequences of a militarized society. We left off last time with the world rebuilding in the wake of World War II. This was not an easy process, but one that saw incredible global change. While the world was either fighting for independence or trying to rebuild their own countries, a showdown was beginning. Two superpowers were starting to collect their allies and face off against one another. These nations were looking for political and economic superiority. The U.S. and their NATO allies were seeking to stem the flow of communism. The Soviet Union and its Warsaw Pact allies, often referred to as the Soviet bloc, were worried that the U.S. was going to overthrow their governments. And of course, they wanted to stop this from happening. The U.S. had demonstrated its military capabilities when it dropped two nuclear bombs on Japan. Within a few years, the Soviet Union would also develop the bomb, and they decided they needed to make more bombs than the U.S., and they even developed a hydrogen bomb, a bomb that was a thousand times or more more powerful than the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The U.S. was shocked that they were able to make the bomb so quickly, so they decided they were going to make more bombs than the Soviet Union could make. Both countries had so many nuclear weapons that if one country fired their arsenal, then the other country would no doubt also fire theirs, and both would probably be destroyed. This is a concept known as mutually assured destruction. It is something that made direct conflict unlikely, as any direct conflict would result in potential nuclear holocaust. But it also heightened tensions between the countries and may have influenced other actions. Just because there wasn't a direct conflict or a hot war doesn't mean conflict went away. It simply moved to other countries, which we call a proxy war. Let's take the country of Vietnam, for instance. Vietnam was looking like it was going to become a communist country, something that the Soviet Union liked. The U.S. didn't like it so much. Tensions were high, and eventually the U.S. went to war in Vietnam, which was officially called a police action, not a war, but for all intents and purposes, it was basically a war while the Soviet Union supplied arms to the Vietnamese. No direct fighting occurred between the Soviet Union and the U.S., but obviously the tensions were there and fueled the fire. This also happened in reverse, like when the Soviet Union went to invade Afghanistan, but was met with strong opposition by U.S. armed Afghani military groups. All the while, the two countries were starting to produce a lot of weapons. Peacetime military spending was typically below 5% of the annual budget. During World War II, it was around 15% of the annual budget. And after the Korean War, the U.S. would maintain a 15% uh, budget for the military pretty much into perpetuity, trying to outspend the Soviet Union on who could own the most weapons. So what? Hey, we're getting there. Just be a little patient. We all know where this is going. You're going to criticize military manufacturing, saying that they promote and create conflict around the world. I make weapons for the good guys. The world is safe. And the moment those weapons aren't needed anymore, I'll make steel beams and baby bottles for the orphanage. Well, why don't we go ask a person at the time? See how they feel about it. Let us travel back to the Soviet Union, 1960. <laughs> Hello, random Russian individual. Can you please tell me how safe you feel, given the current state of the world? I am very safe in my country. We are strongest military. We are told that we have thousands of nuclear bombs aimed at America. Just one bomb will be extremely impactful. Of course, we are also told that America has bombs too that they will fire them at us. Then there is fact that there are wars all around us. This is all too much for me. All I just want to do is grow my cabbages. Thank you, kind sir. Tell me, does that cabbage look a little too green to you? 
<laughs> As you can see, just because there wasn't fighting in some countries doesn't mean people weren't feeling anxious about it. Not to mention that there was plenty of fighting still happening on the periphery of the USSR as well as the US. This brings us to the point of all of this. If these big military expenditures aren't directly benefiting the people, then why were they being done in the first place? Dwight D. Eisenhower, the celebrated mastermind behind D-Day and 34th President of the United States, had some things to say about this in his farewell address. He warned that the U.S. must, quote, guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence by the military-industrial complex. What's the military-industrial complex? Well, it's the marriage between the defense industries that supply our nation's military and the political leaders that make the decisions. Eisenhower speaking to those who would directly benefit from military matters, typically in financial capacity. Eisenhower feared that the military-industrial complex tended to promote policies that might not be in the country's best interest, such as the participation in nuclear arms race, wherein two countries make these incredible world-ending bombs. And he feared that its growing influence, if left unchecked, could undermine American democracy. Why would they do this? Well, the point of a corporation, at least in part, is to make a profit. Arms dealers make the most money when their weapons are needed and they are needed most in times of conflict. Eisenhower argued that not only did this promote conflict around the world, it was also a misappropriation of funds. Eisenhower would go on to say, quote, the cost of one modern heavy bomber is this, a modern brick school in more than 30 cities. We pay for a single fighter with a half million bushels of wheat. We pay for a single destroyer with new homes that could have housed more than 8,000 people. As president, Eisenhower had watched the military expand during the Korean War, so much so that it started to define American life, especially as the demonization of the Soviet Union progressed. The Soviet Union certainly didn't help matters, as it leaned into the Cold War and demonized the United States as well. Largely overlooked by most commentators was a second theme that Eisenhower had woven into his text. The essence of this theme was simplicity itself. Spending on arms and armies is inherently undesirable, even when seemingly necessary. It constitutes a misappropriation of scarce resources, according to Eisenhower by diverting social capital from productive to destructive purposes, war and the preparation for war deplete rather than enhance a nation's strength. And while assertions of military necessity might camouflage the costs entailed, they can never negate them altogether. And Americans had no intention of choosing between guns and butter. They wanted both. The military-industrial complex was alive and well. But then the Soviet Union fell. The enemy was defeated. So no more need to produce weapons, right? Just because war ends doesn't mean there isn't conflict. While national spending will start to decrease for the next 10 years, in 2001, it would come roaring back after the events of 9-11. Well, the poorly defined war on terror, paired with a, an unbridled rise of the American patriotism post 9-11, would give the military-industrial complex billions in new government contracts in order to combat the genuine threats to Americans at home and abroad. While there is a lot of legitimate debate to the response to 9-11, everyone can agree that the current conflict has no end in sight. This is the exact problem that Eisenhower was talking about. The military-industrial complex has no intentions of reducing the conflict. In fact, they are more likely to utilize fear-mongering to increase production such as the bomber gap during the Cold War. Bomber gap was a widespread fear that the Soviet Union had outpaced the United States and that we were vulnerable. This wasn't true, but that didn't stop people from using it to ramp up spending. Let's take a global look at this problem. Have you ever wondered where warlords, dictators, or cartels get all of their arms and ammunition? The black market, you might say. What if I told you that Every single weapon sold in the black market was produced in a legal and fully industrialized modern facility. 
How did they get from there to the black market? When a foreign country leaves a war zone, they often leave stockpiles of small armaments as it is too expensive to take them back. These armaments often go missing and end up being sold off in the black market. Or countries will sell their arms to actors that they think align with their actions. Then those actors will go and sell it to somebody else and then down a line. Or perhaps like when the US airdropped weapons into Syria that were actually taken by ISIS unintentionally arming terrorists. Basically every single scenario comes down to a simple idea, carelessness and the unforeseen consequences. In Africa, 95% of all arms are imported. Once they hit the black market, they are exceptionally cheap. In parts of Africa, an AR-15 can be found for about $10 and in some cases are much more accessible than clean drinking water. This is only going to exacerbate the conflicts for scarce resources like Water. What can be done to stop this? Well, one possible solution is the oversight of international arms exports. It is prudent for the world's largest producer and exporter of weapons of war, the United States, that's taxpayers like, uh, like me and possibly you, to be more conscientious of its military export, especially if those exports are increasing violence and not helping to promote conflict resolution. Despite Eisenhower's worries, the military industrial complex has persisted for decades, spanning the Cold War and the war on terror. The fear that was used to promote these ideas is still used today. You do have some power. You have the power to change that, make informed decisions. Don't simply react to what's scary. Do your research. Find out what is provable and what is merely conjecture. When everything else seems to be diving into chaos, be the voice of reason that calms the storm. As always, have a great day. I suppose the term good guy is subjective. Not to mention that my weapons have found their way into the hands of the Ten Rings, a terrorist organization. I can no longer ignore my role in creating this conflict. It is time I take personal responsibility. To green? They all same amount of green. American spy.